Sisters and brothers, the Church gives thanks for the life and witness of William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury, 1944. He was born on October 15, 1881, and baptized on November 6 of the same year in Exeter Cathedral. His father, Dr. Frederick Temple, was Bishop of Exeter and later Archbishop of Canterbury when William was 15. Growing up in the heart of the Church of England, William's love for the Church was deep and lifelong. Although he never experienced poverty or any kind of any kind, he developed a passion for social justice. This shaped his words and his actions. He owed this passion to the profound belief in the Incarnation. He wrote that in Jesus Christ, God took flesh and dwelt among us, and as a consequence, he, the personality of every man and woman, is sacred. Temple committed himself to seeking the things which pertain to the Kingdom of God. He understood the Incarnation as giving worth and meaning not only to individuals, but to all of life. He therefore took the lead in establishing the Conference on Christian Politics, Economics and Citizenship held in 1924. In 1940, he convened the Great Malvern Conference to reflect on the social reconstruction that would be needed in Britain at the end of the Second World War. Back then, and to this day, there are those who hold the view that the Church should stay in its own lane, that is, to contend itself with dealing with spiritual and not to get involved in other affairs of an island or a country. Listen to some of the excerpts from William Temple's writing. I quote, 
the claim that the Christian Church to make its voice heard in matters of politics and economics is widely resented even by those who are Christian in personal belief and in devotional practice. It is commonly assumed that religion is one department of life, like art or science, or that it is playing the part of a busy body when it lays down principles for the guidance of other departments, whether art and science or business or politics. He goes on, the primary principle of Christian ethics and Christian politics must be respect for every person simply as a person. And further, there is no hope of establishing a more Christian social order except through the labor and sacrifice of those in whom the Spirit of Christ is active. And the first necessity for progress is more and better Christians taking full responsibility as citizens for the political, social, and economic system under which they and their fellow fellows live. End of quote. Let us pray. O God of light and love, who illumined your church through the witness of your servant William Temple, inspire us, we pray, by his teaching and example, that we may rejoice with courage, confidence, and faith in the Word made flesh, and may be led to establish that city which has justice for its foundation and love for its law. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Word of God, written in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ, and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden from for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the Church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this reading, Paul writes to the Ephesians and reminds them of his special commission from God. As an ambassador of the Lord, he has been sent to proclaim Jesus' message of inclusion. He goes on to say that his role as an ambassador means he is a servant of the gospel. He is not only informing the Ephesians of his role in God's plan. More importantly, he is challenging the Christian community to fulfill its responsibility and, like Paul, be ambassadors of the Lord. He says that the church in Ephesus, and more especially God's people everywhere, are to carry forth the message, that is, that all are acceptable to God. Paul also exhorts his readers not to lose heart. He knows from his own experience that there will be difficult days. The road of being an ambassador of the Lord will not be easy. He says 
that with Christ we can be bold and should have confidence. So he tells his readers not to lose heart, but rather carry forward the mission and the message to others. Jesus' message is universal. So Paul challenges the Ephesians to do their part to shoulder the burden and bring Christ to the world. We who are the church today have the same responsibility given by Paul to the Ephesians. We are ambassadors. Now an ambassador is one who is sent to foreign lands to serve as a representative of the ideas, policies and people of his or her country. When heads of state need something from another nation, they generally begin that quest by speaking with the ambassador whose task it is to have the appropriate knowledge and to follow the ideas and principles of the nation he or she represents. William Temple, like Paul, understood his role as an ambassador of Christ. Pray God that each of us may see ourselves as ambassadors of Christ. Remember the words of St. Teresa of Avila, and I quote, Christ has no body but ours, no hand, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses this world. End of quote. We are Christ's ambassadors. Let us pray. God, give us grace to follow his saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon us this day and forevermore. Amen.